chapter 9. Now falleth every man to work. The council contrived the fort. The rest cut down trees to make place to pitch. Their tents, some provide clapboard to relay the ships, some make gardens, some nets, etc. William Simons, E.D., The Proceedings of the English Colony in Virginia. Have we crossed the wide ocean only to be shot by the natives the minute we set foot in Virginia? We servants gather around our mess pot, but no one eats much. James is crying, sniffling, with snot running into his mouth. I want to go home, he whimpers. Richard keeps his eyes cast down. Reverend Hunt said, we tell them about the Bible, he says softly. He didn't say they'd want to kill us. Henry slaps him on the back with a loud whack. You can't believe everything you hear, my boy. Abram's wild eye is vibrating off to the side. I try not to look at him. After supper, I go to find Captain Smith. He is sitting with his quill and paper writing. Now he can add that he fi we finally landed in Virginia, but that the natives do not want us here. I stand waiting quietly. He finishes filling a page, blots ink carefully, then looks up at me. Yes, Samuel? Sir, how will we make a settlement if this is Indian land? Will we have a war? He pats a barrel next to him and bids me to sit down. The men who came back to England from the Roanoke colony wrote about the Virginia Islands. They are interested in trade, and we have brought the things they prize. Copper, metal, tools, glass, beads, needles, mirrors, and such. It will be a delicate balance if we can find a piece of land that they are not using and come to them in peace with goods to trade. I believe we can settle here without a war. He scratches his head, thinking, we must do it without a war. There are many more of them than there are of us. That night, as we bed down, I feel the rocking of the ship. I try to imagine that we are still out at sea rather than anchored near the strange new land of Virginia. I wonder if Colin and the other boys at the orphanage were right, that Richard and Reverend Hunt and I will all die here. There is a box we carried with us that was not to be opened until we reached Virginia. It contains the names of the men chosen by the Virginia Company to be our leaders and directions for us from the Virginia Company. Captain Newport gathers the other ship captains and high-ranking gentlemen on the Susan Constant and opens the box. As he reads the names, at first there were, are no surprises. The men on our council will be Edward Maria Wingfield, John Radcliffe, Christopher Newport, Bartholomew Gosnold, John Martin, and George Kendall. But then he reads the last name on the list. It causes a big ruckus. That name is John Smith. He is still under arrest, Master Wingfield objects. The fact that he is out of his chains does not mean his name has been cleared. He's a criminal, Rat Captain Ratcliffe declares. They raise such a fuss that Captain Smith is not allowed to become a council member. I think Captain Smith would make a better leader than most of the men on the council, but I, what I think does not matter. Captain Smith seems determined to stay out of trouble, just as I am, and he accepts the council's decision without a fight. To me, in private, he says, you will see how quickly they will be begging me for help and advice. Captain Newport reads more of the orders from the Virginia Company. Be careful in choosing a site for the settlement. Go up the river where you can keep a lookout so the Spanish cannot mount a surprise attack. Take great care not to offend the Virginia and natives and begin trading with them for food right away. Do not write letters home with say anything bad about the New World. People in England must not hear a single thing that would discourage them from coming to Virginia. A few carpenters and sailors go on shore and put together the shallop, a small boat meant for exploring that we brought with us in pieces. Then a group of gentlemen go off to search for a place for us to settle. The reports they come back with are encouraging. They have met lots of natives and have been welcomed into their villages, invited to eat with them and watch their dances. They say we do not need to fear the natives. When I look at Captain Archer's bad bandaged hands, I hope they are right. They are also mapping the land and water. They say they have found a point of land with deep water all around and name it Point Comfort. They have planted a ta tall cross at the mount of the bay where we first landed and named the place Cape Henry. The only discouraging news is that they have seen no sight of survivors from the Roanoke colony. Then, finally... In May 13, 1607, 17 days after we first landed in Virginia, our explorers bring us to the news we have been waiting for. They have chosen a place for us to settle. It's a place where 
The river is deep close to shore, so it will be easy to moor our ships to trees. It's got fresh water from the river, rabbits, squirrels, birds, mussels, oysters, fish, crabs, strawberries, and mulberries. It's safe from the natives because they are, there are none living nearby. We'll also be safe from the Spanish because it's on a peninsula and we'll be able to see any approaching Spanish ships for miles down the river. They've named the river the James in honor of King James of England and our settlement will be called Jamestown. The council votes and selects Master Wingfield as our first president. We sail upstream and moor the ships near our chosen site. They seem small, bobbing in the river beneath towering old trees. Their paint of blue, maroon, and yellow, so rich when we began this journey, is now faded and chipped. They have weathered nearly five months at sea, and they show it. As the sun sets, I gaze at what will be our home. There are high bluffs just upstream, but our site has a sandy shoreline along the river. The trees wave their branches in the breeze, and a high gray bird circles, calling out his objection to our presence. We bed down for one last night on the Susan Constant. I lie awake most of the night excited, a bit scared, wondering, waiting for the first rooster crow to signal time to go ashore. The morning of May 14th, even Richard is up and ready for sunrise. I dress quickly and go up on deck to help load the longboat. We pile in as many men and goods as we can, and then the sailors take to the oars and row to shore. When it is my turn, I ride with several of the common men and most of the chicken crates. We unload the crates and set the chickens free to peck around this new world. I wander off a bit before anyone can give me my next task to do. I go a little way into the forest to look around the trees. The trees are so tall, I feel as if I'm in a cathedral. I breathe in the rich smell of damp earth. The leaves are bright early spring green and sprinkled along the ground are tiny flowers of white, yellow, and violet. Butterflies and dragonflies add to the riot of color. I'm either in a cathedral or in paradise, I think. Captain Smith finds me and hands me a straw hat and a hatchet and tells me to get to work. We will begin feeling the smaller trees, felling the smaller trees, in order to make room for our tents and gardens. James and Richard are assigned to work alongside me. My inclination is to work on my own and ignore them. But would it be so bad to work with them? I wonder to cooperate? Better than being chained up by Captain Smith again with no slap bucket nearby, I decided to give it a try. I see that it would be best to have one boy bend a sapling over, another boy chop it at its base with strong downward strokes, and the third boy drag the saplings into a bush brush pile. I clear my throat. Do you want to work together on this? I ask them. I explain my idea. Richard eyes me wearily. Don't let him bend a sapling for you, he warns James. He'll let it go and make it snap into your face. I feel like punching Richard, but I know what that will get me. I stomp off to work by myself. Over the next several days, we boys, servants, laborers, sailors, carpenters, and soldiers work as hard as mules. We set up the tents and bring all the bedding ashore from the ships. We dig up the ground and plant the seed wheat we brought with us from England. We tie spring string in knots to make nets and put the nets in the river to catch fish. We gather mussels, oysters, and crabs and bring them to the cook. We lug buckets of water from the river for cooking and washing and drinking. We fell some of the big trees and split the logs long ways into planks, making clapboards. We load the clapboards onto the ship so they can be taken back to England to build English houses. We also dig up sassafras root to ship back to England. President Wingfield says it will sell at a very good price because it is used to make medicines. I am so tired by the end of each day that sometimes I fall into bed without bothering to take off my shoes. The days are warm and the nights cool. With the constant sounds of insects and tree frogs l l lulling us to sleep, some of the gentlemen pinch, pitch in and work hard, but most of them just take turns standing guard, their muskets ready with slow matches smoking. For several days, it seems as if we're all alone in the Virginia wilderness. Then one day I look up from my hoeing and freeze, afraid to move or even cry out. Two native men come walking through the forest, quiet as deer. 
They each have a long bow slung over one so so shoulder. Halt, shouts one of our gentlemen guards. The Indian men keep coming, and I see our guards prepare to fire the muskets. Wingapo, one of the native men calls out. Wingapo, Captain Smith has told me this is their greeting. It means my beloved friend. The Indians hold up baskets, showing us they have brought us something, and they both smile. They are tall, sturdy men with broad, flat noses and wide lips. For clothing, they wear only a breech cloth like an apron, and their faces and shoulders are oiled with something that gives their skin a deep reddish color, just like Richard heard from the sailors. Their hair jet black is shaved close on the right side of their heads and grows long past their shoulders on the left side with a rigid of ridge of short hair down the middle. The long side has decorations. One man has shells and the other has the whole wing of a bird dangling from his hair. Our guards approach them, still carrying their muskets. The taller of the two Indians points to the muskets, then to his longbow. He lays his bow on the ground, motioning to our guards to do the same. I see the gentlemen hesitate, but then they lay down their arms. We gather around the baskets and find ripe red strawberries, blue purple mul mulberries, and round loaves of bread made from some kind of coarse meal. It all smells wonderful. Captain Smith joins us and begins to converse with the men, using his hands and words from their language. He gives them glass beads and copper in return for the food they have brought. One of the native men sees me eyeing the bread, and he laughs. He breaks the piece off, hands it to me, and nods as if saying, Go ahead, eat it. I say thank you, even though I know he doesn't understand. The bread is delicious. After that, the natives come to us ev nearly every day, sometimes two men, sometimes three. They call it Wingapo when they approach our settlement and always bring us baskets of food. The natives are happy with the glass beads and copper we give them. Captain Smith explains to me how copper is rare and precious to them, so it is like gold it is like gold is to the English, and they have no means to make glass, and so the beads with their bright colors are to them like rubies, emeralds, and diamonds are to the English. At first I thought the Indians were strange to be willing to trade so much food for a few glass beads. But now I see that it is, is if they are trading strawberries for rubies and corn for diamonds. One day, Captain Smith surprises us. I believe the savages are spying on us, he says. I watch the way they look around while they are here. I think they are counting our men, seeing where our tents are located and plotting an attack. We've invaded our land, their land, and I believe they will fight us to get it back. We must build the palisade to protect the settlement. Nonsense, declares President Wingfield. You see how friendly they are. If we build a palisade, it will look as if we are enemies. We will build no fortification. Captain Smith grumbles, but there is no arguing with President Wingfield, and I think that President Wingfield is right. The Indians have been friendly and welcoming to us. Captain Smith's suspicion runs like poison through the settlement. What if the natives are spying on us? What if they are planning an attack? How will we protect ourselves with no palisades? The Virginia Company has provided our men with extra weapons and armor. In England, commoners do not carry weapons, but here almost everyone has them. Still, when the weapons and armor are being issued, by the time they got to the last of the laborers and servants, they ran out. Some of us have no protection at all. Those who have armor begin wearing it all day, even when it's hot. Anyone who has a sword or a musket keeps it at his side. Those of us who have no weapons discuss the merits of protective techniques, like hiding under a mattress. Their arrows will go right through a mattress, you fool. No, they won't. The straw will stop them. Yes, they will go right through. Won't, will, and so on. On a day filled with bright, hot sunshine, I'm digging up a plot, getting it ready to plant more wheat. James arrives with two buckets of water hanging from either end of a yoke balanced across his shoulders. He lowers the yoke and sets the buckets on the ground so I can drink. I take a ladle full, then spit it out. It's salty, I complained. I glared at him. Was his head done this on purpose, just to spite me? But he flinches as if I might hit him, and I see the innocent look at his eyes. High tide, he says quickly. It hasn't rained for a while, and the river mixes with the seawater when the tide is up. It'll be better when the tide goes out, or if it rains. That's what per Master Percy said. I take another swallow of the salty water, but it only makes me more thirsty. Take it away, I said angrily. James slinks off. Reverend Hunt has seen our interaction. 
He comes over to talk to me. Samuel, that poor child, is unwanted by his father and despised by his stepmother. You should be able to find more kindness in your heart for him. I hang my head. I know Reverend Hunt is right, but I have been too tired and too thirsty to think about being kind. That night in our tent, there is more discussion about an Indian attack. Henry and Abram talk of making armor for themselves out of wood. Richard and James discuss what they will do if an attack comes. I'm going to run to the ship, says James. I'll row the long deck, long boat out to the Susan Constant and hide in the tween deck. No arrows can get me there. You are a stupid, stupid boy, I think. I picture him running toward the ships with arrows flying all around and him with no armor. But I don't mock him or tell him he is stupid. I hope Reverend Hunt would appreciate my effort to be more kind.